Hey everybody, it's Mr. Smeeds. Welcome to Apes Video Notes for topic 8.14, which will cover pollution and human health. Our objective for the day is to be able to describe sources of pollution that are linked to human health issues. And the skill that we'll be practicing at the end of today's video is describing a method used in a scientific investigation. So before we talk about specific instances of diseases that are linked to pollution, we have to talk about the concepts of routes of exposure and synergism. So it's difficult to establish exactly the effect of one specific pollutant or one specific toxicant because humans are exposed to so many different toxicants and so many different pollutants. So we have to understand basic routes of exposure as we consider what are the effects of a given toxicant or a diff, uh, given source of pollution to human health. So here are some examples of routes of exposure. Uh, it's just the basic way that the body is exposed to the pollutant or the toxicant in question. So we have lead, which can enter the human body through water pipes that are made of lead and through paint chips as well. So lead was used in paint for a long time. And so when older homes have paint chips that fall on the ground, children oftentimes put them into their mouths or the dust that contains lead on it is inhaled. So those would be the routes of exposure for lead. We can look at mercury, which could enter seafoods, especially bioaccumulating in high trophic level organisms like the tuna. And then when we eat that tuna in our sushi, humans are exposed to mercury. We have carbon monoxide, which comes primarily from indoor biomass combustion, especially in developing nations where subsistence fuels like charcoal or wood are heavily relied on and they're burned in open fires indoors. We have particulate matter, so anything like pollen or dust, this is just going to enter your respiratory tract just by virtue of it being in the air. We have arsenic, which can be exposed to the human body via rice. So sometimes rice will accumulate arsenic in its tissues, and then when we eat it, we take it into our bodies, um, but also groundwater that's been exposed to arsenic, either from you know flame retardant chemicals or wood treating facilities that are releasing it, or just the natural decay of rocks that contain arsenic and releasing it into aquifers. Now we'll talk about synergism. So synergism is the idea that two or more pollutants or toxicants oftentimes have a combined effect on human health or it could even just be an environmental condition, or what we have learned uh, a lot about through COVID is pre-existing health conditions make a big difference to a patient's health outcomes. So some examples of this would be the fact that asthma from particulate matter from a coal power plant could also be exacerbating COVID-19's damage to lungs. So it's hard to isolate the effect of COVID-19 when we could have an impact from coal-fired power plants nearby as well. Another example would be the carcinogenic effect of asbestos combined with the fact that someone was already a tobacco user or a cigarette smoker. So it's hard to isolate, is their lung cancer the result of asbestos or is it the result of damage from smoking cigarettes? And so this is this idea of synergism. Again, think of it as almost like a confounding variable. Really hard to look at a human and say, your illness or your exposure to this toxicant is purely from this source and the cause of your disease or your condition is purely from this individual toxicant. So again, it just makes it hard for epidemiologists to pinpoint the exact cause of an illness or a disease. So even though we'll learn about some upcoming diseases that are linked to specific pollutants and toxicants, we need to remember that because humans are such complex organisms that do so many things in so many different ecosystems and environments, it's difficult to isolate the health conditions to one specific you know, toxicant. So the first human health disease that we'll talk about that is related to a specific contaminant or pollutant is going to be dysentery. So dysentery is a bacterial infection that can occur in humans when their food or their water sources are exposed to raw, untreated sewage. And this is because that sewage contains feces. Now this could be human feces, it could be animal feces, but this is really common in developing nations where access to water treatment is not as widespread as it is in developed nations. Um, so this is going to be a really deadly disease. It's going to cause intestinal swelling. The bacteria will promote an inflamed you know, immune system response and an infection that's going to cause potentially blood in the feces, in the stool. Uh, it can lead to really severe dehydration because individuals that have dysentery will oftentimes have really violent diarrhea. And that's their body trying to flush that pathogen out of their intestinal system by just voiding the bowels constantly. And so it's a really uh, problematic impact, especially for young children because of dehydration. So their bodies are smaller, they're retaining less water. And so as a result of this constant diarrhea, it can lead to dehydration. It's going to kill 1.1 million people annually. 
Again, mostly in developing nations with poor sanitation, where there's contamination of drinking water, especially with human sewage. So this is a really big problem globally. And it's one of the reasons that so many philanthropists, so many epidemiologists and environmental scientists that care about human health outcomes are focused on trying to expand clean water access, um, filtration devices. And that's one of the main ways to prevent dysentery. Once a human uh, has encountered dysentery and has been infected with it, there are antibiotics that can be given to try to kill the bacteria, and that's going to try to allow the body to stop having to, again, constantly flush the intestines out. So that can definitely help. Hydration can help as well if an individual is taking in, you know, a lot of water or liquids that have electrolytes that contain, you know, basically ions that help them contain and retain more water. That will help as well. And then finally, again, the way to prevent it is filtration of water sources, uh, making sure that the water that people are drinking is clean, that it is not contaminated with the bacteria that cause dysentery, and that it's not infected with human sewage. Next, we'll talk about mesothelioma, which is a specific type of cancer that comes primarily from exposure to asbestos. So when asbestos is exposed to the respiratory tract, when the particles are inhaled, oftentimes it will lead to the development of these cancerous tumors in the lining or the epithelium of things like the respiratory tract or the heart or the abdominal cavity. So what's the route of exposure here? Well, that's going to be primarily old insulation. So remember that attics and the ceilings of buildings, sometimes even flooring tiles or insulation used around water heaters used to contain asbestos before we realized its carcinogenic effects. And so when those insulation sources are disturbed, when we go to renovate the area, if it's not done properly, those asbestos particles can make it into the air, they can be inhaled and they can have these consequential effects on, on the human body. So we look here at the asbestos particles uh, or fibers that are kind of being inhaled. They're going to target, you know, the pleura, the lining around the lungs. They can target even, you know, areas in the periosteum, which is basically the cavity in the thoracic cavity of, of someone. I'm just going to target the epithelium, the lining of these surfaces, and it can lead to really problematic cancers that develop. So when we look at removal of asbestos, how should this be done? Well, we want to be clear that it should be done by professionals who are wearing proper ventilated materials. They're going to have a respirator and a mask like this to keep it out of their eyes, to keep it out of their lungs. They're going to have a body suit that's going to keep it from getting attached to their clothing or making contact with their skin. Notice that the area is completely sealed off. And so we're trying to prevent any asbestos particles that enter the air from entering other parts of the building. You're going to want to have good ventilation. You're going to want the particles to be you know, routed outside where they can disperse and not build up inside and be inhaled by, you know, the people that are doing this work or the people in other parts of the building. So I can't stress this enough. It needs to be done by a trained professional. You should not be removing asbestos containing materials yourself. Um, it needs to be done by trained professionals. And then this may seem obvious. It may seem like it goes without saying, but if you were writing an APES FRQ about asbestos and about reducing the threat of mesothelioma, you would really want to specify that the insulation that replaces asbestos should be asbestos free. I know that seems super obvious, but what I'm trying to do here is just point out FRQ writing skills that can, you know, elevate your answers and increase the likelihood that they earn points. So you really need to be clear that asbestos should be removed by professionals who are wearing equipment that allows them to breathe filtered air, not get the particles in their skin or on their clothing, and that they should replace the insulation with non-asbestos containing materials. And we'll wrap up today by talking about tropospheric ozone. So remember that tropospheric ozone or O3 is going to be a general respiratory irritant. So it's going to decrease lung function. It's going to worsen pre-existing respiratory conditions like asthma, emphysema, bronchitis, or COPD. So it's not so much that it gives you an acute uh, lung disorder like this, but it's going to worsen your overall lung function and exacerbate or make worse pre-existing respiratory conditions. It can also irritate basically the muscles of the respiratory tract. It can uh, constrict the bronchioles or the air passageways that are bringing air into your lungs. So it can really have some dramatic consequences on the human respiratory system. It can also irritate the eyes. Uh, so it's something that is really harmful for a variety of systems in the human body, but primarily the respiratory system. We take a look here at a diagram that can just help us kind of remember and visualize some of these you know, it can cause kind of a burning sensation and irritation of the muscles and the lining in the throat. It can result in a pretty severe headache. It can be burning or irritating to the eyes. 
And then once it gets into the lungs, when it's inhaled deeper in the respiratory tract, you know, it can cause coughing, it can cause basically, you know, acute attacks of asthma flare-ups. So really a problematic respiratory irritant in a variety of, of avenues here. So if we take a look at some of the sources of ozone or the routes of exposure, it's going to primarily come from NO2 emissions. Remember the NO2 nitrogen dioxide is going to be emitted by vehicle exhaust, by coal-fired power plants especially, and it's going to combine with the sunlight, and the sunlight's basically going to knock off one of the oxygen atoms from that NO2. That free oxygen atom combines with O2, molecular oxygen, in the atmosphere, now we have O3, and that's ozone. So I've added a little edit here to this otherwise great diagram that I found online. Um, it's not pollution plus heat and sunlight, it's NO2. Um, so not an apes approved diagram without that little edit there. And then one final thing I wanna recommend that we remember, uh, really important, is that ozone is tremendously beneficial when it's up in the stratosphere where it absorbs a lot of UV radiation that could be cancerous or uh, cancer causing for humans that can damage plant tissue. So in the stratosphere, it is essential to life on earth. In the troposphere, it's harmful. And again, that's because of these respiratory um, irritating effects that it has. So for FRQ 8.14 today, we have a scientific investigation that we're going to look at, and we're going to try to come up with a claim about which group should serve as the control, and also a disease that these scientists could look for in the population of the people of Huangsang to basically see if this wastewater treatment plant that we can see in the triangle here uh, is impacting their water quality, and if it is leading to raw sewage being released into the river. A couple things to point out, uh, the flow of the river. So you want to look at that arrow to, to know which direction is the river flowing. You want to look at S1 through S6. These are six sites that the researchers may sample water quality. And then you want to look at the triangle, which is the sewage treatment plant. So taking all of these factors into account, the first part of this FRQ is if scientists plan to measure fecal coliform bacteria counts at the six sampling sites below, make a claim about which site should serve as the control group. Make sure to justify your answer with evidence. So why did you pick one of these six sites as the control group for this study? Uh, the next part of this FRQ is to identify a human disease that the scientists could test for in the population of the Huangsang village here to see whether or not it supports the hypothesis that the sewage treatment plant is releasing untreated sewage.